On June 22, 2006, U.S. Army First Lieutenant Aaron Mutata refused deployment to the Iraq War. As a result, he faced court-martial and up to six years imprisonment. His reason for refusing to serve was that he came to the belief that the war is an illegal act, and his continued participation would itself be illegal. His defense for the trial was centered on presenting testimony that supports this view. However, weeks before the trial, the military judge declared that all such evidence would not be admissible. His many supporters held a citizen's hearing on the legality of U.S. action in Iraq to present to the American public the testimony that was not allowed in the trial. This video contains highlights of that hearing. Do each of you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You may be seated. We were always instructed that if we deemed an order to be illegal, that it was our duty as professional soldiers to not follow that order. And the first line of the non-commissioned officer's creed is, states that no one is more professional than I. And I believe that as a professional soldier, it is our obligation to refuse all illegal orders. I personally failed in that. I spent 13 months in Iraq, and on one particular day, we had a, a unit had a traffic control point set up, and as the vehicle sped towards this traffic control point, an 18-year-old kid, fresh in the military, he was a private first class, so he was probably in the military for a matter of months, and this car sped at it, their traffic control point, and this private made the f split second decision that that vehicle was a threat. He pressed a butterfly trigger on his 50 caliber machine gun and put more than 200 rounds into that vehicle. He then stood there and watched as the results of his decision were dragged from that vehicle. A mother, a father, and two children. Boy, age four, girl, age three. I sat in a room that evening when that was briefed to a general. I was lucky enough not to be on the scene, but when that was briefed to the general, it was briefed in much more gruesome detail than I gave you. They had pictures and they showed them of what would happen at a TCP killing. The general, I'm pretty sure, had a clear understanding of what happened. And a full bird colonel, the rank just below general in the military, and for those of you who who are not military, if you've ever met a full bird colonel, you've probably met someone who's trying to reach general and looking for that star. This colonel turned to an entire division level staff and made the following statement. If these fucking hajis learned to drive, this shit wouldn't happen. These are definitely the stories that someone like Lieutenant Watata would hear coming back in uh, Fort Lewis. So uh, I would ask that you take a look at things like this in your consideration and compare the things that I've told you that I know the general heard because I sat there and I know that other generals heard it to include General Casey because I was there when he was briefed too that uh, these things are not something that happen in low level and when you hear from some of the other Iraq veterans realize that they go all the way up the chain of command and while I have never heard a briefing to the Secretary of Defense nor to the President I'm willing to bet that if a Brigadier General gets this piece of information, so does the Secretary of Defense, and so does the President. The uh, members of the convoy saw a uh, woman and her two, da two daughters in a uh, bean field, uh, working, you know, hoeing, hoeing the bean field, and they must have suspected her of being a uh, lookout or a spotter or a trigger, a trigger person for the IED, and so they ran after her, and this Iraqi woman seeing coalition forces running after her with weapons understandably ran away but and so the coalition members started firing at her and the result was that the uh, mother lost her leg and one of her daughters was shot in the head and killed and there was no action taken because um, I was investigating this as as 
uh, director of the Office for Coalition Provisional Authority, Kirkuk. It was my business to investigate this and bring it to the attention of the government coordinator, who was a very senior British diplomat. Um, there was no action taken against the uh, people who had shot the mother and the daughter because they were considered to be evading capture under the uh, rules of engagement, and so no action was taken. Over the course of the next several months, I um, had the opportunity to, to reflect on the Iraq War and, and came to believe that, um, that one, of course, there was no threat from Iraq to the United States at the time we invaded Iraq, that, there were, that the case for war was essentially false, even deliberately falsified, and that uh, our presence was not benefiting the Iraqi people, that um, internal polling within coalition provisional authority showed that support for the coalition provisional authority was at two to five percent, and the vast majority of, our, of Iraqis wanted us to leave, and it was just a question of what timetable they wanted us to leave in, but they all wanted us gone. And I, I came to believe that nothing we would, nothing the coalition could do would materially help the Iraqi people and that the occupation itself was part of the problem. Uh, when you raise your right hand, you take an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States from all enemies, foreign and domestic. And when I went to Iraq, I feel as though I put our Constitution in jeopardy. I did not uh, honor that oath whatsoever. And therefore, I failed in that regard. And I also failed to uh, to disobey unlawful orders when I went to a war that at the time I disagreed with and realize is an illegal order to even deploy to Iraq. And so, yes, I do. Uh, it's probably the most incompetent occupation and aggression in the history of empire, actually. Uh, when, when would you have to look back? But. There is this additional element that unlike Vietnam, but like Saddam's attack into Kuwait, like the Soviets in Afghanistan, like Hitler into Poland, France, Norway, Belgium, and Holland, and the London Blitz, and Russia, and Japan, into Manchuria, and China, and Malaysia, and Indochina, clear-cut aggression, crime against the peace well described as the preeminent of war crimes that includes all the other crimes within it. Uh, Aaron Rutwada uh, did not have to go to law school to figure out that we've got an illegal war in this case. Uh, uh, you, you have to be virtually totally ignorant, like most of his colleagues, uh, of the whole context of the thing to have any question about that in your mind. So I would say the sh the, not just this court martial, but most courts uh, have been, uh, fr from top to bottom, civilian and military, have been irresponsibly uh, ignoring that question now for generations, and this is the time to try to hold, hold them to it. The people who devise the torture screams and the, and the free fire zones up at the high level, they don't carry it out. But they do carry out the overall operation, the free fire zone, which is as clear a violation of Geneva Conventions as you can get. Uh, and that's what Kerry, John Kerry, admitted in the Winter Soldier hearings, which were not unlike these. When he said, I committed atrocities, what was he talking about? He said, he, after all, he was a lieutenant uh, you know, on, a, on a PT boat. What atrocities had he done? And he said, I took part in free fire zone operations. Anybody who moves is fair target. He's absolutely right. That's a war crime. The people who ordered that, I would say, were as blatantly criminal and therefore, the obligations arise not only to resist that, I'm sorry, not only to not do it, but as Jeffrey Miller pointed out, you're told that your obligation is to prevent that, as in any crime. So I don't think these issues have been addressed by this country, and that has put us in the position, not only as a society, of being a society that condones torture and war crimes, but condones a war of aggression and is about to commit another one. That is an intolerable situation. It should be an intolerable dilemma of conscience right now, and what it challenges us to do is not to hold people accountable, but to stop this, and to stop it with our bodies, stop it with our whole vote.
It is a, a great uh, personal uh, privilege to take part in this uh, hearing. I think it's probably the most patriotic event I have ever participated in. And, and I want to frame my remarks by reference to the Army Field Manual 27-10 that sets forth the rules governing the behavior of a soldier in time of war and makes two central uh, points that are uh, of a great relevance. The first is that international law is applicable to the behavior of an American soldier in time of war. And secondly, that such a soldier has the right, if not the duty, to refuse unlawful commands and may be potentially held legally accountable for carrying out such commands that violate international legal obligations. So it seems to me beyond all uh, reasonable uh, doubt that this judge, this military officer acting as a judge, has put Lieutenant Watada in a totally uh, intolerable situation where he is, uh, has been given an, an unlawful order because it is tantamount to an instruction to participate in the Iraq war to be deployed to Iraq. There is no other uh, sensible understanding of that uh, deployment order. And therefore, if he is being uh, ordered to do something that he has every reason to believe, a belief that is endorsed by the overwhelming, uh, cons an overwhelming consensus, that this is a order that is implicating him in the gravest crime against peace imaginable, and he has no chance to even raise that issue before this tribunal, this military uh, tribunal, then it's such a blatant denial of justice as to itself uh, constitute a kind of crime because he's being uh, criminally disallowed from obeying the law. It's quite... Uh, so it seems to me that this situation, which draws our attention to an ongoing war of aggression that is daily killing Americans and many Iraqis, is a situation of such urgency that exercising this Nuremberg obligation is not only something that is an appeal to the conscience and the law-mindedness of Lieutenant Watada, it is an appeal to the conscience of all citizens, indeed all persons, to take what action they can to stop the continuation of this aggressive criminal war. Thank you very much. In fact, you have to go back, I think, to the Spanish-American War, to a case of a General Smith, who was a brigadier general who was court-martialed for violations of laws of war. He made an order at the time which said to kill all the insurgents in the particular area of the Philippines. And one of the soldiers there asked, well, who's an insurgent? And he said, it's everybody over 10 years, every man over 10 years of age. And uh, Lieutenant Waller, as it would turn out at that time, refused that order. Um, and actually, in the court martial of Brigadier General, was honored or considered praised for his refusal of that order of his general. And I like to think that Lieutenant Watada, with the benefits of the internet and all that, has basically done the same thing Lieutenant Waller did in 1902, and uh, and should have the same kind of respect that happened in 1902. Yeah. The second thing is on crimes against humanity. 
we do have the Nuremberg principles that are here that um, you have in your folder. I want to cite you also to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court where crimes against humanity are uh, detailed at Article 7 and should take a look at them, which they elaborate out sort of uh, an updated uh, version as of 2000 of types of crimes that uh, could be committed in Iraq. Um, and with regards to crimes against humanity, um, certainly you see issues of torture, rape, um, uh, murder, things like that, that could be, uh, my answer on the question of crimes against humanity is yes, probably in Iraq, we have to bring forward the evidence to find it, and people need to pre present evidence like evidence we've, uh, we've heard this morning from people who've been in the area to, to bring forward information with regards to um, the types of crimes that have been done and whether they rise to the level of crimes against humanity. A second area uh, that I've been asked to ask about war crimes, my answer on that is definitely yes. We've already seen that with the prosecutions of the low-level people at um, Abu Ghraib and some of the other cases that have happened. Um, now, the, whether there are greater numbers of war crimes and higher up in the in the government, I, I would say yes, probably. Uh, again, we have to bring forward the evidence of those things. Uh, in a sense. It, will, it is a very uh, self-delegitimizing self act of this tribunal. Mm. They would have been much better off if they had listened to him and then ignored it, <laughs> which you could predict without being too cynical that they would likely do. Uh, this way of proceeding suggests a certain, maybe healthy, sense of insecurity. Mm -hmm. that, the, that, the argument, that the arguments against the war are so overwhelming and so little can be said in defense of the war that to allow that argument to be heard even is itself subversive of the war effort. The United States of America, the most powerful country in the world, did not fulfill its obligations under international law. The four questions that we're supposed to be asking, was the, was the war a legal war? No, it wasn't. It was a war of aggression, which our international law experts have adequately defined. Was the war prosecuted according to international law? No, it was not. We have not done anything as far as coming close to the obligations that we have as an occupying power. And to put the people of Iraq in such a tremendously uh, dangerous health-wise, security-wise position as an occupying power is a war crime. In fact, it's multiple war crimes. From Afghanistan, from the people picked up on the battlefield, to their treatment in Bagram Air Base, to flying them to Guantanamo for the stress positions they were put in for hours at a time, for the environmental, the hot, the cold that they were put in, the waterboarding that happened to them, the beatings that happened to them, started in Afghanistan. And the same military folks that were at the orders of the civilian leadership of the United States of America, George Bush, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Colin Powell, who did not stand up when he should have, those people are responsible for the environment that led our U.S. military down a path of criminal activity. Our military, not only are our civilian leadership war criminals, but tragically, there are people within our own military have, who have committed specific criminal acts of torture. Not only our military, our CIA, and contractors who have been hired by the Defense Intelligence Agency as well as the CIA. And it started in Afghanistan, and it went to Guantanamo. And then Iraq, the war in Iraq. And those same techniques that were used in Afghanistan and Guantanamo were transferred by Jeffrey Miller, Major General Jeffrey Miller, who is a war criminal. We, the people, have to stand up because it's, it's, not, it's not 
shouldn't fall on the shoulders of the military to be making the determinations of whether this is a legal or illegal war. Uh, it's, it's a part of us to hold our Congress accountable for allowing this thing to go forward. But since we are where we are, what can we do? I would say we need to make sure that that lieutenant colonel that's the head of the court martial at Fort Lewis knows that the civilian population around Fort Lewis has a view on this. That we try to make that lieutenant colonel as courageous as the first lieutenant has been. That that lieutenant colonel will stand up to say, it is my role to, to afford a proper, a fair trial to another military service member and that I will take the heat. I will risk my career from the colonel that's above me, the general that's above him or her, the four-star general above all of that, the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States, which is essentially, those are the people that Lieutenant Watata has taken on. I call upon that Lieutenant Colonel to be every bit as courageous as the Lieutenant and allow the testimony on the illegality of the war. Now, where do I begin with the UN failure? Well, I think we have to go back to San Francisco in 1945, when the new international body to replace the League of Nations was cooked, massaged, created, whatever, a machine for control. Control of the world's natural resources, control of wealth, people, territories, by the five victorious powers that survived the World War II. Britain, Russia, France, China, and the United States. They designed the United Nations without civilian oversight, such as a Supreme Court-like entity, which you have in this country, of course. There's no even application of justice. We live on double standards in the Security Council. There's no semblance of equality and democracy, except perhaps in the General Assembly, which has now been somewhat sidelined over the years. But most grievously, the Security Council was intended to dominate in perpetuity the global machinery of peace and security. The UN irreparably damaged the social and cultural life of Iraq. And before that, the UN had destroyed, in the name of finding weapons of mass destruction, every place of manufacture in the country, including food processing, cold storage, baby food plants, and the basic pharmaceutical supply companies that Iraq had at that time. Without regard to consequences, the UN basically cut the throat of Iraq, a country that imported 70% of its food supply, and a country that had a health system which had been acknowledged by the World Health Organization. UN sanctions created an unemployment situation of some 70%. Not much worse than, frankly, it still is like that today. The school system was awarded by UNESCO for its quality, but it collapsed for lack of materials and loss of teachers who could no longer be paid. The very real advances of Iraqi women and their equality under law was undermined, demolished by the demands of survival under sanctions. The UN set in motion a brain drain the flight of some two million professionals, doctors, engineers, scientists, architects, and other invaluable people overseas, so they could have, a, have the capacity to su support their families. And as you know, the 2003 invasion and occupation and the chaos that's now resulted has produced another two million refugees overseas and 1.7 million uh, Iraqis displaced within the country. The UN cannot continue to serve the vested interests of the rich and the powerful. It must belong to all, it must serve all. And success requires that all member states respect and abide by international law and understand the advantage of all so doing. Without that, the UN is doomed. So I would suggest, let us end investment in Mr. Bush's fictional war on terror. Terminate our own terrorist methodologies. Let's communicate and try to understand each other. Dialogue is civilized behavior. Military aggression is not. And let's invest in people. Let's not invest in weapons. Let's invest instead in human well-being. Now, Lieutenant Watada has taken a unique stand. And it's now, as Anne Wright has said, up to the rest of us, perhaps Americans in particular, to support what he has done, to draw attention to and hopefully stop the current quagmire resulting from American war crimes in Iraq, which started with an illegal act of a military aggression and then blatantly an act of state terrorism. And I refer, of course, to shock and awe. Clearly, there's no justification for an invasion or an act of terrorism. 
Watada, by his action, has highlighted the possibility of ending further decline of American soft power, values, and humanitarian outreach, the benign potential that this great country has. Lieutenant Watada has reminded us of what this country could be, rather than the rapacious neo-colonial empire it has become.